in the Bible. Today we're going to talk about Palm Sunday, and I want to do 10 outtakes from Palm Sunday. Now, first of all, I want to talk about an outtake. What is an outtake? Well, an outtake is something that is taken out. That makes sense, doesn't it? <laughs> Such as in a film, it's that it takes a scene out uh, that is not used in the final cut of the film. So that's called an outtake. A lot of them that are taken out are called bloopers. Anybody ever seen a blooper uh, where they, they really messed up? Sometimes the bloopers are more entertaining than the movie. Isn't that correct? Yeah. <laughs> So, hey, it's also used in the recording industry when there's a song or a stanza, a verse or something that they take out. That's an outtake. Now, for us today, I want to use the term outtake as something that is taken out such as an event that is taken out of time in history and it is actually recorded in the Bible. So it's been taken out of time in history. Not everything is recorded in the Bible. You get that, right? And so God has taken some things out of history and recorded them in the Bible. Now for us today, each one of these outtakes is going to have the word out in it. So this is what I mean. The first one is Jesus dined out. Anybody here ever dined out? So you got the idea. He dined out, okay? And I get that. It was six days before the Passover. The Passover was on Friday, so this would put this on Saturday or the Sabbath day. It's the day before the Sunday, Palm Sunday. All right? And so uh, six days before the Passover, Jesus arrived at Bethany. Oh, we talked about Bethany Sunday last Sunday, right? This, he's made this kind of his headquarters of his operation for the last week of his ministry. And so Jesus arrives at Bethany where Lazarus lived. Now what's important about Lazarus? Lazarus is a guy he raised from the dead whom Jesus had raised from the dead, and here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Why would they honor Jesus? Well, he just raised Lazarus from the dead. I mean, that, that's a noteworthy thing. That's a, that deserved a Bethany pen, don't you think? <laughs> yeah, that was a Bethany moment. All right. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table. They didn't sit at the table. They, they reclined at the table. And, and so, well, where's Mary? Well, we'll find out. Mary's behind the scenes. She's got another little mission going on. But it appears that the din dining out uh, wasn't at some fancy restaurant, but it was at Lazarus or Mary or Martha's home. Most likely Martha, because Martha is the one who's serving, and she's attending to the guests who are at the party. It's all in the, for Jesus. Dining out is so important. But you know this thing I, I noticed that's missing here? We don't know what's on the menu. Did you notice that? I don't know. Did he have lamb? Did he have grapes? Did they have nuts? Were there bananas? I don't know. Coconuts. You know, dining out is really not about the food. Do you guys get that? Now, the food is important, don't get me wrong. <laughs> but it's not about the food. It's about the people. He doesn't list what food was there, but he tells you who was there. Because dining out is about the people. Almost every Sunday, there's a group that dines out from Bethany. And some Sundays, we announce the place where we're going. And somebody will say, well, I don't like the food there. Too bad, it's not about the food. <laughs> it's about the people. It's about fellowshipping. It's like to be there with those people. I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall. Maybe not a fly. They might have swatted me. <laughs> but I'd love to have been at that dinner. Uh, come on, can you imagine the conversation? Because they weren't saying, hey, uh, boy, you know, the, the food next door is a lot better than the food here. You know, you know what the conversation, this is what I would like to say. Hey, Jesus how did you raise him from the dead? Don't you think somebody might ask that at the table? How did you do that? When I do a chalk drawing like I did Friday night, somebody comes up and says to me, how did you make that Jesus appear out of, out of off the, the, the curiosity? You don't think somebody was going to ask Jesus, how did you do that? I would have loved to heard that answer. Right? Can you imagine somebody at the table turning and saying to Lazarus, hey, Lazarus, what was it like to be dead for four days? Didn't you, don't you want to know that answer to that question? Hey, <clears throat> did you go to paradise? Did you go to heaven? Did you go to Hades? Where did you go while you were dead? Would you like to hear the answer to that question? Okay. Did you see a bright light? Did you see the angels? Did you see God the Father? I mean, there's some questions I think that 
Just normal, everyday people would have asked at the table there. Everything that went on was not recorded, but he's recorded this for us, that it's, it's very important to have dinner with other believers that's honoring Jesus Christ. Amen. It's called fellowship. Do you know there's a verse in the book of the Revelation that Jesus has already died, been buried, risen, went to heaven, and John is given a vision of the Lord Jesus, and the Lord Jesus is outside the church knocking on the door. He's knocking on the door, Revelation 3.20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears my voice, so he must have been calling and not just knocking, he's saying, hey, hey guys, I'm out here, this is Jesus. He's knocking on the door. If any man hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in with him and I will New King James Version. I will dine with him. Isn't that great? He's not talking about just eating. I mean, there's, it's far more than the eating. Of course you're eating because Jesus is embodied. He's eating. But it's more than that. It's fellowshipping. It's that conversation at the table where you connect with one another. You talk about what's going on in your life. You ask the questions that are important. You get the answers that are important. It's that dialogue that is going on where you are fellowshipping with God. That's what he's saying. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will open the door, I'll come in with him and we'll fellowship. We'll dine together. First outtake I have here is Jesus dined out. The second one I notice in the story is that Mary poured out. She poured out a very expensive perfume. Then Mary, <clears throat> the sister to Martha and Lazarus, Mary took about a pint of pure nard. A nard came from northern India, so this came a long way. An expensive perfume. <clears throat> how expensive? Well, later, Judas is going to tell us how expensive. It's a year's wages in price. Now, I don't know if that talking about a poor man's wages, middle, middle class wage or high wages, but probably it was a, a, a poor person's wages. And I don't know what that, if you translate that into American dollars, I don't know. We're talking about something that's maybe 20, 30, 40, 50,000 dollars in value. Whoa, that adds a little bit to the story. This is a big chunk, a really important piece of her life. This may be her most valued treasure, her most valued possession. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wipes his feet with her hair. Now, this, this perfume is filling the, the whole room with its, with its fragrance. It's on Jesus' feet, so anywhere Jesus will go, the perfume will follow. But it is also on her hair. Everywhere she goes, the fragrance follows. The house was filled with the, the fragrance of the perfume. What she's really doing is she's taking her life, a year of her life, that's what it would take to buy this. And she's pouring it out to Jesus. She's giving him, not the leftover, the very best. It's a perfume. So the fragrance of Jesus now, because she's given it to Jesus, she's poured it out on Jesus. Because she's been with Jesus, wherever she goes, she's carrying the fragrance of Jesus. And isn't that what this is supposed to be about? I come to church on Sunday. I feast on his word. He speaks to my heart. I spend some time with Jesus in worship. And then when I leave this place, I carry with me the fragrance of Jesus. Everywhere I go. Then I come back in again on next Sunday, I get a little bit more fragrance of Jesus. So it'll carry me through my week. Mary poured out. She poured out her life. Judas was all freaked out. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, he objected. You know, we get freaked out when we don't get our way. Did you ever notice that? Some guy went whipping past me this week, and he was all freaked out, apparently over the way I was driving, and he gave me the Italian salute. <laughs> he was all freaked out. Why? Because he didn't get his way on the road. You know, I must have been driving too slow for his liking, all right? And he weaved around. We get freaked out when we don't get our ways, and we make an objection. Here's his objection. Why wasn't this perfume sold for the money and given to the poor? 
No matter what you do for Jesus, somebody's going to complain about it. You, you hear me? No matter what, what decision you make, how you decide, nobody knows your heart. And, and, and you, when you just do it in your heart for Jesus. He's objecting. Now, now, he's looking so pious about this. Sometimes the most pious people are objecting to the wrong things. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He was pilfering the funds. He was an embezzler. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself. He'd put his hand in, take a little bit out for him. He'd be like the person at the church. Or the plate is going by and they realize, oh, hey, look, there's money in there. I, I might take a little bit. That'll cover my lunch today. You don't think that has ever happened? We collected some money one time at a previous church and we set it in the office on the counter. It was our change collection. You know how we do the coins? And it was in, in there. So the person went out of the room, come back a few minutes later, and it's all gone. You don't think this kind of thing happens? Judas was actually reaching in, dipping and taking. He's all freaked out because he knows if that money had been put in there, he would have had some, and it was messing up his own plan, his plan. It's at this point that Jesus spoke out, spoke out. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. I'm not sure what Tony said that in. But Jesus is called an advocate in the Bible. An advocate is the attorney that represents us. Here he's showing how he's an advocate. He's, he replies, he's stepping up, he's defending. Mary doesn't have to say a word because Jesus is saying it all. Leave, it, leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. It was in God's plan all along that she would have this perfume. And she, from your perspective, you thought she was wasteful and she was wasting it, but that she would invest it in, in my body in preparation for my burial. Here's a tip-off. She was more in tune with what God was doing than Judas was. She knew that Jesus was going to die and she is pouring it out already on him. He says, you will always have the poor among you but you will not always have me. He was her advocate. There's a verse in, in Revelation chapter 12 that says that uh, Satan is the accuser of the brethren. Come on, anybody here ever messed up? I didn't see any hands. Okay, I'm the only one. How many here have messed up? Sometime in your life, you really, you, you know, you've messed up. And you know when you do that, Satan, the accuser, runs in presence of God and says, Aha! Did you see what Dennis Henderson did? And he claims to be the pastor. Did you see what he did? Oh, he really messed up. And, and you know what? I know it. The devil knows it. He accuses me of it. He wants me, you know, he, he wants me to feel really bad about it. And so I do, I feel really bad about it. And, and then my advocate steps in. He doesn't even have to say a word. He just shows his hands, the wounds. And he says that's paid in full for. He steps in, he pleads my case, he pleads your case, he speaks up, he spoke out for her, he speaks out for us, he pleads our case. I have forgiveness of my sins in Jesus Christ. Jesus is our advocate. He spoke out and he still speaks out. The people found out that he was there. Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and they came. Hey, wouldn't you? Not only because of him, that it was Jesus, but also to see Lazarus, from whom he, he had, the, the guy he'd raised from the dead. And so the crowd is amassing. Listen, I would have been there at least as a curiosity seeker. The buzz was out in town, and everybody's coming to, to the place to see Jesus. I, I got to imagine they were thinking, if he could do that for Lazarus, maybe he could heal my family relationship. I, I got a strained relationship with my son or my daughter or my, or my mom or my dad. Uh, he, he could fix my financial problem. I mean, if, if he could raise the dead, surely he could, he could show me a, a way to get out of the fix I man. I don't know what's going in the people's mind, but the crowd, if nothing else, for curiosity's sake, they're going out to find Jesus. It's at the same time that the chief priest planned out an assassination plot. 
In the previous chapter, in John chapter 11, verse 53, it tells us that they had already made designs and planning to kill Jesus. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well. For on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and putting their faith in him. <clears throat> Later going to be told that they were jealous of Jesus. Come on, Jesus spoke with authority. That's what one text says. He didn't speak like the scribes and the Pharisees. He spoke with authority. You know, he was a master of, of, of the language. And, and you know, he, he could sway a crowd. Jesus was, uh, was eloquent. He always had a good story to tell that really illustrated the point. And so many times it put the Pharisees in their place by telling those stories, the parables. To top that off, what they couldn't do, he could do. He, he'd perform a miracle. Man, the guy fed 5,000 people. And then there were 12 baskets of fragments left over that they, they took home as, you know, leftovers. He walked on water. I mean, the, the guy just raised the dead. How can you compete with Jesus? They're jealous of Jesus' ministry. So what do politicians do when they can't beat the other person on the points of their, their ideology? They assassinate their character. Isn't that right? They dig up all the dirt they can find. And if they can't find any, they make it up. That's exactly what they do to Jesus. They're eventually going to try him on trumped up charges that he blasphemed, which he did not do. If you, they're assassinating his character. They want to kill him. They want to kill him. And they want to kill Lazarus too because the more people who see him and get the story of his testimony are going to come to Christ. Put their faith in him. And so there's this planned out assassination attempt. Well, that didn't stop anything. The next day, this is Palm Sunday, the crowds went out to meet Jesus. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the feast of the Passover that was going to go on that week had heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. He's two miles away. He's out at Bethany. And it says they, they took palm branches, which you're all given one today, and they went out to meet him. They were seeking Jesus. Seeking Jesus. And they're shouting, Hosanna! Save, I pray thee. That's what it means. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Quoting from Psalm 118, verses 25 and 26. Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This is part of the section of the Psalms where they would sing these songs as they were going up to Jerusalem for this Passover meal and this time of Passover. And here they are. They're quoting the Psalm, the Word of God. Blessed is he. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Then they say, blessed is the king of Israel. People are fickle, aren't they? Just five days later, Good Friday, the people are being crying, crucify him, crucify him. May his blood be upon us and his, our children. Crucify him, crucify him. The crowd at this point, though, I think is different from the crowd on the Friday. This crowd, is, uh, they're the ones who have believed and they're following Jesus and they're shouting out, blessed is the king of Israel. And Jesus rode out. He found a young donkey. The other accounts tell us that as he rode out on the young donkey that this is a, a, a colt. And this colt is not a broken animal, but this, this colt yields to Jesus, probably more yielding than some people. He yields to Jesus, he sat upon it, and then a quote from the book of Zechariah, do not be afraid, daughters of Zion, see your king is coming, seated on a donkey. The rest of, of Zechariah 9 says he's lowly having salvation. He's meek, he's humble, he's coming as the savior, the king of salvation. You know, from our perspective, Jesus has already come. Palm Sunday is already over. But there's a second coming of Christ. In the book of Revelation, it tells us that he's going to come the second time, not on a little lowly donkey, but he's on a white stallion. And when he comes from heaven, he's not coming to be the Lamb of God and be sacrificed again, because he sacrificed once for all, it tells us in Hebrews. 
But he comes and he comes as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and he puts down every opposition. He divides the sheep from the goats, the, those who, who, who follow him and those who do not, and he sets up a kingdom among his people that'll that'll last for a thousand years as an introduction to all eternity, the eternal state. And so he rules and he reigns as king of kings and lords of lords. Listen, he is the absolute king. This is King Jesus. He rides in. We call it the triumphal entry. It really was a triumphal tragedy because ultimately they crucify their king. It says above him on the cross, king of the Jews. And they say, take that down, take that down. Why, he came unto his own, his own received him not. When he comes a second time, he's going to destroy all of his enemies, set up his kingdom, king of king and lord of lords. Which leads me to the next point. The disciples missed out on this. They missed out on this prophecy. At first, the disciples did, under, did not understand this. They didn't get it. Only after Jesus was glorified, that he was died, he was buried, and he rose again, and he's glorified in his glorified body, did they realize that these things had, hap had been written about him and that they had done these things to him. They did it just as it had been predicted in the Bible and the Old Testament. You know why they missed out? They did not know their Bibles. They did not know their Bibles. Had they known their Bibles, this probably would have triggered off in their mind. Hey, this is Zechariah 9.9 going down here. Hey, this is Psalm 118 going down here. But they did not know their Bibles. It is so important to know your Bible. So important. That's why I put the Bible up on the screen. I think it's more important you know the Bible than all my flowery stories that I could conjure up and tell. Because this is what you need to know. This is the truth. This is the word of God. They missed out because they just did not know. The final one is, the tenth outtake is this. The word spread out. Spread out. Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. <laughs> Everybody was telling, I mean, did you hear what happened? Oh, my goodness. Hey, and so-and-so, he told me this happened. They were there. And the word was spreading word of mouth. You know, more people come to church by word of mouth than any other means. It takes a personal invitation. You just ask someone to come. Someone to come. The word was spreading out, and many of the people, many of the people, because they had heard that he had given this miraculous sign. The sign is something that points to a truth. This sign that he raised, Jesus, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead pointed to the fact that he was the Messiah. They went out to meet him, and so the Pharisees said to one another, see, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the world has gone after him. Hey, folks, that's our mission. Get the world to go after him. The word needs to spread out. I want you to help us spread the word. On your way out today, we're going to have some little cards like this. They're little invitation cards to service this Good Friday. This Friday is Good Friday. Next Sunday is Easter. You personally invite them. It says, rethink Easter. And then it just says, Easter is the greatest story ever told. We will view it from a new perspective this year. We invite you to join us on Good Friday and Easter. And it's just a little card, an invitation card. On the back, it has a map of directions how to get here. You can leave this at the restaurant with your tip. You can invite it, invite your next door neighbor. You can carry it in your wallet until the God speaks to your heart to the person to give it to. We made them really small so you can put them in your shirt pocket. You can, in fact, you can hide it in your hand. So in case you cow get cowardly and you, you, know, you back out, <laughs> they don't know that you got it. And then if you want it, you flip it out. Oh, there, there, there it is. And you, and you use it. Your invitation, see, the word will spread out, and when the word spreads out, they came seeking, looking for Jesus. So which one of these outtakes describes you? I, I mean, I think our, we're, we're in this. This was recorded because it's timeless truth. Where are you in this story? 
Are, are you the one dining with Jesus? You have fellowship, man. You get up and, and you feast on his word. And, and he speaks to you out of the word and you have this fellowship with him. And then you, you have this prayer time with him and, and you pray to him and you're dining and you're having this fellowship with God. Is that where you're at in the story? Are you pouring your life out for Jesus that people just know there's a fragrance about you and people just sense and know that you're spending time with Jesus? Are you in the story? Are you listening? He's stepping up and he's an advocate for you. He says, Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. Do you hear Jesus speak through the day? You've read the word and through the day something happened. You say, oh, yeah, Lord, I see what you're doing here. And you have that conversation with him through the day? Are you seeking him? In the Old Testament it says, you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. Are you wholehearted about it? Are you finding Jesus? Are you seeking him? Are you praising Jesus? That day they were praising, Hosanna, Hosanna. Are you singing one of these praise songs or hymns in the shower when you get up in the morning? I know I sing better in the shower than any place on planet Earth. Are you, are you praising him? Are you praising him? Where are you in this story? Are you sharing Jesus? So simple to do. You just invite somebody, come, find Jesus. I found him, you can find him too. So simple to do. I'd like you to pick one or more of these in the story today. So that Palm Sunday, because it becomes such an impact like it was on the original Palm Sunday, find your spot in the story and carry it out in the 21st century. Let's pray. Father in heaven, 10 outtakes. You took these out of all that went on at that time and placed them in the Bible for our understanding. Somewhere in here, there's a message for each one of us that we need to take it to our heart. Impress it upon us now, what we are to do in light of your word. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen.